my, my guest today, Rob Levier. I'll clap. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Absolutely, brother. Man, there's some interesting talk happening. I, I, the crux? The crux. Yeah. The crux. The yeah. crux escape room. Crux escape room. My mind is a mystery when I read it because I can't put myself into the situation. So, man, give me the meat and potatoes. So you, you've never played an escape room, man? Never. So the, the, the core concept of an escape room is you go with a group of your friends and there's some kind of mystery you have to solve or a room you have to escape. And you have to solve a series of puzzles to move forward to finally meet the objective, which more often than not is escaping. Right. The escaping became less important when the fire department said we couldn't actually lock people in a room. Uh, so then it became more objective. I'm trying to, you know, loot the museum or whatever the whatever the goal is. But there's a series of puzzles and you have to solve the puzzles. Right. Uh, how did you get around that then? Uh, we, we just just a little bit more creative and letting the guests know that you're not actually locked in a room. Okay. Uh, that's that can actually keep people away from playing escape rooms. In fact, the very first escape room I played, I did so reluctantly. My friends kept trying to bring me up to this escape room and it sounded anxiety inducing. And you know, I'm, I'm a big guy and I'm claustrophobic and I don't want to be locked in anything and you're not putting handcuffs on me for nothing, right? Oh, no, so I had no. this whole, no, I'm not doing this. They dragged me out and it wasn't anything like that. It was, you know, deciphering the clues and solving the ciphers and getting the physical pieces together. But like the magic moment for me in my very first escape room was I unlocked a box and there was a light switch in it and I flipped the light switch and the black light came on and the entire space completely changed because everything was in UV ink and it was a super cool moment. You know, and then five years later when the black light's in an escape room, it's like, ah, oh, another black light. But the very first time you see it, it's this cool feature. Beautiful. I'm, I'm beyond excited just hearing those, those elements right there. The light comes on and the room pretty much changes, right? And you go with your friends and you're, you have to communicate, you have to interact. So it becomes, you know, as adults, we get into these things that we do together as adults and they're usually competitive. You know, whether you're a golfer, you play sports, you yeah. play poker, you don't tend to do things cooperatively. And myself, I came from a board game background. My friends and I play lots of board games. Nice. But that's competitive, that's yeah. mean. And, you know, I, I win at the expense of you losing. I can do what you can do. You got it. Got it. But in escape room, you have to work together. And that's, that's a totally different dynamic. You rapidly learn which friends you want to play in escape room <laughs> and which ones you don't want to play in escape room. Nice. So I fell in love. Like we played our first room, we went to the bar after, we were there for two hours, just nonstop talking about how cool it was. And this would have been, I'd say like October, November. I had a New Year's Eve party planned for my house. So I designed my first escape room Ooh. at the house. And it was chintzy, a bunch of you know, hardware store locks, chintzy props. I got a question for you. The most of the set, was it upstairs or downstairs? <laughs> it was all basically the tabletop. Oh. It was really, it was more about getting into containers as yes. opposed to getting out. Okay. But the goal again was the puzzles and making people cooperate. Escaping. All right. So I had a lot of fun doing that. My friends had a lot of fun. And, Fast forward a couple months, I met the owner of the local escape room. A uh, lovely young lady, she had just moved back to Canada. She was in Hong Kong working for the online uh, gaming business. Right. Moved back to Canada, decided she wanted to open an escape room. And this would have been, I think there was maybe one or two escape rooms in Canada at the time. So smartest move in the world. Basically uses her credit cards, buys a bunch of uh, secondhand furniture, combination locks, decorates the hell out of it and makes this cool quirky experience. That's so really nice to work with. Downtown Niagara Falls. Oh. And it's just booming. It's customer after customer after customer. I hope you heard that. We're here. The escape, <laughs> escape room. I know. She actually had some, some drama as well where her and her partner ended up battling it out and she ended up leaving the industry. But before she had left, I had basically, I hung around until they gave me stuff to do. And that's Every hobby I've gotten into, just that's what I do. Eyes. You just show up yeah. and do stuff until you're indispensable. And she kind of got me my, my foot in the door. And another friend of mine, he's a, a professor at the University of Lor Wilfrid Laurier, a game design professor. And right. he's actually written research papers on escape rooms. So I had these two interesting connections. So there was two gentlemen from Hamilton who owned an escape room company in Hamilton, and they wanted to move into Niagara Falls. They heard this other company was leaving. They wanted to move in and pick up this traffic. Okay. But they didn't want to show up and do, do it themselves. Right? <laughs> so they checked around and both of this, this lady and my friend Scott, they both recommended me and I did my, my sales pitch to them. And it's kind of a, a running theme in this that ultimately 
the things that have happened were likely my own mistake because I didn't really understand business. I understand the fun part, the, the making of things. Yes. When I sat down with my what would end up being my future business partners to negotiate my deal, I opened with, I would do this for free because <laughs> I'm dumb, right? But it's what I wanted to do. Someone's going to let me build this cool stuff yes. with their money and then I get to run it? Like, that's fantastic. Well, what an amazing opportunity. That's the dream, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but you know, we had a little brief talk before the show. I, I have a day job, so I didn't really, I wasn't worried about making my living. I didn't have to pay my mortgage. I didn't have to put my kids through school yeah. running an escape room. This was going to be a hobby business for me. But, you know, Two, three years down the road, I've probably put as many hours per week into the escape room as I did in my day job. Um, in, you love it. in three years, I built eight permanent experiences. So an experience is basically the game itself. It could be a single room, it could be multi-room. And then every year we design like a pop-up Christmas themed room. All right. And th those were always fun experiments because we would, every year we were surprised that Christmas came. Mm -hmm. It'd be the beginning of December and someone would go, oh crap, we need a Christmas room. Yeah. So in seven days, we would design and, and build an entire experience. And normally it would take us months to design, plan, build. <laughs> so uh, overall, I built about 10 escape rooms. I'd say three really good ones, <laughs> four or five good ones, and then a couple of... When you say really good, what differs from the ones that are bad then? It's interesting because it's hard to plan out what those good moments are going to be. Right. I, I still, one of my best rooms, and not just my own opinion, we actually won some awards in the escape room community, was the very first room that I built. So I, I guess I'll, I'll go back to that, that origin story again. Yes, but name those awards, please, real quickly. Uh, it's the Room Escape Artists from New Jersey. Okay. They travel the world, they play hundreds of escape rooms every year, and then they pick like their top 10 rooms. Okay. And what they accredited this room with was, um, that it was an immersive game, it was uh, a quality puzzle design, and done on a budget. Most of the rooms that win these awards, they're $50,000, $100,000 builds. They look like Disney attractions. You go to Toronto and some of the big companies, it's amazing what they can construct. Uh, investment put in. So I had a budget to build this room, and I, I basically, we got no. I may have misrepresented what my that. skill sets were. I knew I could design puzzles, I knew I could design the game. But here I promised to physically build the room. I had never used a power tool in my life. I used Google to figure out how to frame, how to mud and tape, how to install windows, how to install doors. Um, I found out after I was done building the walls, they said, well, why did you nail them? Why didn't you screw them? And I said, I didn't know a screw gun was in the budget kind of thing. So I literally pounded every, I wasn't as fat back then. I was back fit when I started the business. Uh, but yeah, I, I hammered in every single nail. And, you know, blood, sweat, literally blood, sweat and tears in this game. And the theme of the room was, there's, in the escape room industry, there's certain themes that they people kind of laugh at, just like they laugh at the black lights now. Yes. They, they laugh at jailbreak rooms, Egyptian themed rooms, and yes. zombie rooms. And my first room was a zombie room. Ooh. But we did a twist, and actually it's appropriate for this venue here. It's the zombie apocalypse, and you're hiding out at the local rock and roll radio station. So we built a radio station with an AM DJ booth, an FM DJ booth, a lobby, and we made all the puzzles out of what you'd expect to see in a radio station. But think more like, um, you might not be old enough, but WKRP in Cincinnati. You know, yes. The low budget local radio station, not a huge you know, blockbuster franchise across the, the country radio station. So it's this low budget, it's all the posters for the little, the little indie bands, it's gold records on the wall, wow. it's trophies and awards, and there's actual a guitar was part of the puzzle. So the whole thing was based on what would you see in a radio station? And we wanted to build it around that. And my, my son's a fantastic artist, so he invented all these fake band posters for me. So every band is completely made up. Some of them spoof actual bands, but most of them were just these unique creations we made for the puzzles, and they made this phenomenal artwork. Interesting. But the, the key that the reviewers had said was the, the thing that made the room different and rose it above was the hint system. In most escape rooms, the hint system is either a video monitor where the clues come across the screen, or the game master gets in the microphone and kind of nudges you through the puzzle. Yeah. So you're a little bit stuck, you ask for a hint, the hint comes on. What we've done is we pre-recorded an entire radio show. The, with, hint, the hint part, sorry to kind of slow you down, yeah. the hint, how do you give out the hint? Well, that's, that's what we're leading into here. Ooh. So like I said, normally you'd either type it onto a screen for them on a video monitor or talk to the microphone and go in the room. Okay. We use the DJ. 
So we had a rock and roll soundtrack, and there was already hints built into the DJ's, you know, the little bits and pieces he throws in between the songs. Okay. But then we recorded about 30 to 40 hints in the DJ's voice. Some of them were commercials for things, but they were obvious hints for the puzzle that the players might be working on. So whenever the players would get stuck and ask for a hint, the game master would just find the spot, click the button, and then this hint would play. And then we kind of adjusted as well. The original escape rooms were all about, you only hinted when people asked for hints. But what we discovered is if you've never played an escape room before, you forget that we told you about that at the beginning Absolutely. of the game. Panic. So then we just kind of nudge them to make sure that they're moving. Yeah, but then we figured out how to do it without them even noticing. Because if we waited till the song to end, pause the soundtrack, play the hint, put the soundtrack back on, it was seamless. Mm. And you could, you could have some fun with the customers, make sure they kept moving. What worked better to do? Exactly. Really have them stuck in the mind. So the, the room was high energy. It finishes with We Are The Champions blasting over the stereo when you do the final thing in the room. And everyone got really engaged with it. Yes. The downside of this room is the puzzles were bloody hard. hard yeah. Because it was my first room, I didn't understand that you don't have to make things hard. You have to make things fun. We are the <laughs> champions, my friend. So with each successive room, we got better at tweaking those puzzles to make them more engaging and less difficult. Because mm -hmm. uh, what we found was, <laughs> I, I don't mean to sound mean to my customers yes, at all. Say it how it is. If we were dependent on clever people to succeed, we would have failed in the opening week. <laughs> Especially when there's a clock going. You take the smartest person in the world, you've got the clock going, they can look at the simplest puzzle, and their brain is going to find 20 ways to solve it wrong. So if you make it overly complicated, yes. then the average people aren't going to enjoy the experience. The fun is gone. You can have a couple tough puzzles as long as you're willing to, okay, I might have to nudge that a little bit, yeah. but you, that, you know, that, that Disney ride is the right way to approach it. You want the, the flow of energy. You want the customers to constantly be moving. They'll slow down a little bit on a hard puzzle, and then once they're through that, they just keep moving, and there's this nice energy flow as they play the game. The accomplishment, they so, to solve something. And what I found is the designer and builder, and I also would always be there when the games were running. So when the groups were in, I'd be watching them. And half the time, I'd, I'd take over. And my staff would always say that. You know, I'd steal the intros because I love customers, love talking to customers. Right. And I'd hop in and help them run the games. And you learn how they interact with it. So you try to reproduce that. And sometimes you'd fail. You'd go into a design, and it didn't quite work. Okay. And then sometimes you'd have one puzzle in one of my rooms. It was basically a throwaway. We needed something. We whipped it up quick. We threw it in. And it was the most satisfying puzzle. And, and it hit. I, I have this whole list of rules or game design philosophies now. And this came out of it hit the, the, the bench, the, the gold standard for me in that every group pretty much solves this puzzle. Every group feels clever solving the puzzle. What? And the answer advances the story of the game. Okay. So it hits all three of those criteria. So, and I started to realize they don't have to be hard, they have to be fun. And if a group gets that excited about solving an easy puzzle, I'm just gonna throw more puzzles in the experience. Exactly. Give them more of what they came for and have some fun with it. So we'll flash forward to March of this year. Yep. Uh, my company had, at one point we had five locations. We got down to three locations. We had Hamilton, St. Catharines, and Niagara Falls. Okay. And we had just spent seven months in ballpark $70,000 building out our new St. Catharines location. Now, this location has moved twice. Um, my one partner prides himself on being able to negotiate strongly with landlords. So we've been evicted twice and had to move our location twice. And when I say we, I mean me, because I was the only person that showed up to physically tear these rooms apart, move them to the next location and rebuild them. So the bulk of the work. We go into COVID, we spent seven months, $70,000 getting the location running. We were open for four days when we got the order that we had to close. Now, going into that, all of our traffic was fantastic. Probably the best that's ever been. Our Hamilton location, Niagara Falls location, the traffic just kept going up and up and up. We'd finally hit that forward momentum. Everything was going good. And then? And then COVID. But COVID wasn't the only thing. I talk about this. I don't, I'm not a business guy. I'm the creative guy. I'm the artsy guy. I want to build the cool stuff. Behind the scenes, there was two primary partners, and I had a lowly, small stake in the company. I didn't even have voting shares, but I did all this stuff. Yes. One of the partners had left the company and put in his option to get bought out, and the other partner didn't want to pay him because we were spending all this money building a location and wanted to delay it. All this stuff is going on and on and on, dragging out, dragging out. Yes. We get into COVID, and the other partner sues us because we haven't paid him his money. Oh, it's been no. over a year. So there's all this drama going in the background. And then my partner decides, you know what? Why don't we close the Falls location and move everything to the St. Catharines location? We'll just 
pick up the rooms, load them up there. The St. Catherine's location, he happens to own the building that may have played part in that decision-making process. I started tearing my babies apart in Niagara Falls. Oh, no. Uh, the one that won the awards, got that one apart, a little bit sad, took another one apart. I've been working on a little side project in the falls for about 12 months. Most of our groups are very small groups. You know, two to four players, it's usually couples come out and want to play, or a mother and her kids want to play a game. And of course, we make more money shoving 10 to 12 people in a large group game because it's per person, $30 per person. That's a heck of a lot more money with 10 people in this three people. So on the side, I was building this tiny little experience in a, sp a spare space. It's a, a witch's cottage. You start in the witch's oven, you have to escape her oven and, and escape her cottage. My staff and I had built all these cool little props. Which is up. Are you literally starting in an oven? Yes. It's ah, a big oven. Okay, okay. I would have to duck to go through the door. Uh, we had the perfect name for it. It was called Easy Bake Coven. We wanted to have a little bit of a, a punny name. So everyone knew it wasn't a scary game. It was going to be a silly game. Uh, and it was the first game that I did that wasn't a whole bunch of combination locks. Every piece of the game is technology. There's not a single combination lock or key lock in the game. Everything is you interact with something yes. and then something else happens. Ooh. The game is narrated, so it's got this story element to it. And it's, it's been my pride and joy. I've worked on it for a year. But it was life RPG. It's designed for two to four players. It's my nice. fault. Okay. So you go with you and your, your, your partner and get to go and play this game and have a fun time. Wasn't going to make us a lot of money, so this is my passion project. So I go to take the witch's room apart. I cut the first wire. Oh, nope, I'm not doing this. Called the landlord and said, if I leave my company, can we make a deal for me to get this space? Because I don't want to abandon my false location. There you go. This is my baby. So that was about two months ago. Okay. Uh, we did some fighting back and forth. I had written a proposal to my partner about, this is what I'm willing to do to keep the Niagara Falls location. And it basically was me installing my two best, my two original award-winning rooms in his St. Catharines location, again. making sure that his new staff are all trained up and ready to go. I won't even use the existing intellectual property in Niagara Falls. I'll start from scratch, but I need the assets that are there, and I need the space, and I need to be released from my non -compete. Okay. We argued for two months back and forth, <laughs> just over the dumbest stuff. Uh, finally, last week, he messages me and says, okay, I got a deal for you. We described the deal, and I think, you moron, that's what I offered you two months ago. <laughs> so we finally got where we needed to go. I've got a heck of a lot of work ahead of me, yes. but I will be reopening in the same space with some new creations. Uh, what's nice is I have a fantastic staff, yes. some, some great students, some great local people. They've all got their own unique skill sets. My, my manager who ran my front of house, fantastic skills, no formal training whatsoever. In the three years she worked for me, she learned everything she needed to learn. All of my game masters contribute. And all of them are kind of like, yeah, we'll, we'll do this new thing with you. And I like that we can use those local people for this. I like that I get to stay here and do this thing. And the thing for me is, my partners always wanted to kind of be the McDonald's of escape rooms. They wanted to, they, they, at one point they wanted 10 locations. They wanted to maximize their revenue. They wanted to automate the experience to take the game master out of the situation. Basically, you give us your money, we put you in the room. When you're done, you walk out, we get another. That's fantastic okay. if you want to make a ton of money. So how did this go down? I don't want to make a ton of money. Okay. I don't want to make cool shit. <laughs> That's all I've ever wanted to do. Maybe, maybe the question I really wanted to know is, did you guys actually go through it yourselves to see what it was like. Uh, when you design it, you can't play it, but I've played upwards of 100 different escape rooms at different locations all across North America, and you kind of learn the parts that you do like and the parts that you don't like. Uh, and I have to be cautious of that myself as a designer, that there's certain things that I don't like in escape rooms that others do, Right. so I have to be careful not to exclude those things from the experience. Interesting, interesting. But even my own staff, they get mad that they can't play the stuff that I make because they like what I make. Though my graphic designer, my manager, recently played one of my rooms. They were playtesting it for me. They had literally helped me make a specific puzzle like to the point of cutting it out, printing it the whole bit, and it, it baffled them. They had no idea how it worked. And I'm just, how did, you made this. How did you not know how this works? But uh, I forget the pin on my credit card on a regular basis. So and that, <laughs> man, I want to thank you for coming out. This is very interesting. I just learned quite a lot. And you're still in the falls, right? Yes. Beautiful. What's your location? 
We are at 5001 Victoria Avenue. Okay. We haven't released a new name yet because we haven't locked down all of our social media accounts. Okay. That should all be finalized by the end of the week. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I want to thank you for coming out. No problem. Thanks for having me. Rob Levian.